Everybody see this? So I'm talking to some kids about a month ago, and they're all excited to hear about all these startups and great ideas, and their question is, well, what can I do? What can I do to get involved in all the things that are going on around me? And I said, well, I'll tell you what, let me put together a program or a couple thoughts for you, and then those are thoughts that I don't want to offend anybody here. They're much younger than you are. But I want to share with you because I think there are a lot of things we can learn from different groups of people. I'm actually reading a phenomenal book. I love to read, so it seems like every time I'm reading a book, it's phenomenal. And it's better than everything I've read before. But this is written by an astronaut. And things we can learn from an astronaut while living on Earth. I'll share some of what he talks about in the book, but it's unbelievable. So, this is interactive. I'm going to ask you guys questions, and I expect you to be able to answer, all right? Who recognizes the guys, the two guys on the left? Who? Nobody? It's the Wright brothers. Wright brothers, okay? And then I'm assuming then, and this is going to be a safe <laughs> assumption on my part, that the person on the right, you understand who is. Okay. So when did the Wright brothers first fly? Late 18th century. Late 18th century? No. 15th. 1903. Late 19th century. 1903. Okay, extra credit for anybody who knows what day in 1903. Okay, well you can carry that extra credit for it and we'll give it away next time. It was December 17th. Does anybody know how long they were in the air? No, not five minutes, less. A couple of minutes. I no, think. less. Fifteen seconds. Twelve. Twelve seconds. Okay, so the twelve seconds in the air, 1903, and they went a distance of how many meters? Almost. Take a quarter of that. So they went about 45, there, it's anywhere between 40 and 56 meters. So 1903, so imagine T equals zero, right? How old is the Earth? Four, three, five, doesn't matter, 13, really doesn't matter. T equals zero to 1903. It took that many years for us to figure out, for them to figure out. And now we use it, Nakira, you the best sign, right? <laughs> us to figure it out. To go 12 <coughs> seconds and 40 meters. 1903. Einstein published his theory of relativity in what year? Nineteen fifteen. So his theory of relativity isn't even a hundred years old yet. All right? And now if you think about it, and I know most of you in this room, including myself, were not alive back in the early 1900s, but the amount of progress that we have made in a hundred years, 110 years, is absolutely unbelievable. All right? We'll talk about it in a bit. You've seen this, that everything that Apple, or most everything that Apple now makes money from, didn't exist seven years ago. All right, so they made unbelievable progress in a hundred years, or, or they set out, um, put mankind on a path to start doing some incredible things. Now Apple's been able to reduce it to seven, and so what you can pretty much tell is that if you leave school, if you've developed a program, and you have, this is the, the business plan canvas, if you have an idea, I can literally guarantee you that that's gonna change. So, and it's going to change not because you want it to change. It's going to, be cha it's going to change because somebody here is going to say, I've got a great idea, and guess what? I'm going to do it. And you can't stop it. And if he's pretty good, he'll step into your business. Does anyone know who this gal is on the left side? I did not ask you guys, do any of you want to know who she is? I said, do any of you know who she is? No. She's Elizabeth Holmes. She's 30. She has already raised $45 million. Henry Kissinger sits on her board of directors, and she has designed a product where out of one drop of blood, you can do 100 blood tests. One drop. So not needle, vial, anything else, one drop. She is rolling this product out, or this service out, in the US in a chain of stores called Walgreens which is the equivalent of DM plus pharmacy, right? 
She's putting that machine out. Now think about this for a moment. Here's a 30-year-old girl, probably started working on it when she's 26, and she took what has been traditionally a blood lab in a hospital environment and moved it into Dan. Didn't ask any hospital, didn't ask any owner, said, I'm doing this. And she put her mind to it, she got the, the, the resources, the money, obviously, and now she's doing it. Amazon announced this product about two weeks ago, in, first in the US, I'm sure it'll be uh, in Europe soon, where you simply scan in all the stuff in your refrigerator, barcodes, you can actually push a button and tell it that you want three kilos of potatoes. And with one button, you send it up to your Amazon account. The next day, the Amazon people bring it to your front door. So Elizabeth took the blood lab out of the hospital and moved it into Dan. Amazon took your grocery store, Tesco, and moved it to your front door. And they moved into, into areas that nobody asked them to show up in. Just having fun, came up with a crazy idea, and they started off on. So the idea, most of you know about this. I mean, it's just unbelievable what is happening and what will happen. This crazy thing is about to live a new life. If you've seen, obviously this is a chip. If you've seen this graph before, by 2025, they say 50 billion things, that's five times 10 to the ninth, will be hanging off the internet, IOT, Internet of Things. And by 2050, that will be one trillion. That's a thousand billion. Now, if you do nothing other than assume that the growth is linear from 2025 to 2050, and you go from 50 billion to one trillion, the difference is quickly. What's the difference between one trillion and 50 billion? 950 billion, just, I'm just, you know, no charge for that one. So 950 billion, if you do that linearly, that means that every day we will install 104 million new things that will hang off the internet. Every day for 25 years. And all these things will be sending out data, they'll be sending out information, stuff we don't even know how to process yet today, which means that the world that we think, the world that I'm trying to figure out for my kids is going to be much different than what they actually do. So actually having the knowledge will obviously not be the key to success. It's being able to understand the process. And now I don't want to talk about the university. I want to talk about you. Because I do not believe that you will be successful as a business person if you are not successful as a human being. I think the two overlap. And what we want are more citizens who are successful human beings that are also successful business people. Why don't we do this? I mean, we talk about these kids and we talk about what's coming down. Most people, they feel fear. I give a speech inside a church. Normally old people show up. And I start talking to them. The, the topic of my speech is how exponential technology will affect the business model of the church. So 75, 80, 90 year old lady sitting there. And when we talk about technologies, normally a reaction is, I'm so happy I won't be alive. Which is okay if you're 90, but for I think most of us who have a desire and a passion to, to get engaged, that is not, simply not an acceptable approach. But we're full of fear, I know I am. Not necessarily regarding that technology, but in things that I've done in the past. And so I want to talk about a personal example uh, on how I overcome the fear my background is in economics. I'm not smart. I am not a doctor. I'm not an engineer. Um, I'm passionate. So I guess this is what happens when you have a low IQ and high passion. And does anybody in this room recognize what this building is? It's a prison. It's a prison. Right. It's the youth prison in Tokyo. Has anybody in this room been in jail? <laughs> yes? No. Okay, so I invited myself to jail a few years ago because I had never been to jail. And I wanted to motivate inmates. So I called up the, the office in Budapest and I told them who I am and I wanted to motivate inmates. And they said, well, we don't really know who you should talk to. Give us your number and we'll call you back tomorrow. And they did. And so it took about three months and then I found myself in this building. Once you go in, if you've never been in jail, once you go in, there's a magnetic block so you can't go out anymore, unless they want you to. But you can't go further in either, because there's another magnetic block. 
All right, so I'm sitting there, my hands in my pocket, I'm all alone, and there are things I don't know. I don't know how many inmates there will be. Do not know why they're there. Don't know if they're happy. Don't, like, don't know if they like what they got for breakfast. I now can say pretty much they don't like what they get for breakfast. And so what happens when you start, you sit there and you don't have the information? You start creating information, you create answers in a vacuum. And what you normally do, if you're a normal human being, is you start to scare the hell out of yourself. A friend of mine was flying on a plane to Chicago. She didn't like flying. As they were landing, the plane tilted, and one of the wings went into the cloud. Normal, everyday thing. She looked out the window, hit the stewardess button. The stewardess shows up, may I help you? Where did the engine go? A moment ago, the engine was here. Where did the engine go? And the stewardess had absolutely no, couldn't figure out what this gal was all worried about. But she looked out the window and didn't see the motor or the jet engine and immediately assumed that it had fallen off and that they were going to crash and they were going to die and, you know, who's going to be around to feed the dog at home. And when you don't have access to information, you scare the hell out of yourself. And so one of the things which we'll talk about is not only for yourselves, but for everyone around you. You know, it's very simple in the world today. Either you carry yourself in this economy, or we carry you. There really aren't too many other alternatives. So either Joel adds value to the system in Hungary, or the Hungarian system is considered to be so fair and so nice and so everything else that, well, we say, okay, poor Joel, then we give him money. And that's not really a good investment, but that's the way it works. All right, so one of the things you do is, so here I am, I, I have no idea how many kids there are going to be, so I go in this room, they take me to the back of this jail, I'm dressed in a suit and tie, and the guard is standing at the door, I'm standing where Joel is, and 30 of these kids go in. They're all between the ages of 14 and 18, they all have this little chair, the hook at me, that they're stoky. So they all walk in, and so, you know, this is the first time I've ever seen people like this, that close. And the guard closes the door, and he stays on the outside of the door. So the earlier fear factor now has gone up, mm -hmm. right? So I now not only do not know why they're, how, you know, are they happy or not, but now I'm locked in a room with them. And so there's not, there aren't too many options in a case like that. So you either figure it out or you don't. Uh, we'll talk about another one. There are some, sometimes in life you only get one chance. Okay, I'm an economist, I'm not nearly as stupid as I may look. So I, through my mind, figured out what could I do? What's my only tool? So what do you think, if you're in a room with 30 people who are in jail, what do you think your most effective tool is to be able to create a dialogue and drive that discussion? Humor. What, humor? humor. A little bit, I'll tell you what one of the guys said. It's respect. So if I can't get them to respect me, they can, they can do plastic surgery on my face faster than anybody can make it into that room. It's very simple. If you don't have people's respect, you're not going to be able to get them. So I was obvious you can see from the, from the enclosed example that I was able to uh, leave that jail. And I got their respect. And I asked these guys, one of, you know, 30 guys, and you know, now we're actually, don't repeat me, but now we're actually having a good time in there. And I asked them, how many of you read? So there are 30 guys, 14 to 18, how many do you think read? Books. Zero. No more than zero? But not much more than zero. One. So out of 30 guys, one guy read. So I asked him, I said, well, stand up. I mean, what are you reading? And he says, tutti frutti, mongrasi. I said, that's not the kind of reading I had in mind. I said, hey, that's what they get, right? I mean, you know, we need to get more textbooks in there. But the fact is that once you get through something like that where it scares the hell out of you, and then you come out successful, then you've got what I call a bucket, and you start filling it with a little self-confidence. Because now I can take that experience, and I can use it in other parts of my life. So now, if there's a challenge, I don't immediately assume that I'm going to come out a loser, that the results are going to be unfavorable for me, I almost assume, and you can call it arrogance, is that I probably have a pretty good chance of coming out a winner. And I think it, we have to take responsibility for this, is we need to fill our own buckets. Now, for me, it's public speaking and it's some other, other things that I do, but those are the things that I have a passion for. 
Don't ask me to, to uh, sew pillows, because I don't know how to sew pillows. Sewing pillows does not fill my bucket. But I guarantee you, all of you have something that you can fill your bucket with. And in more than just filling your bucket, you set the example for all the people around you, because now you empower them to do the same for themselves. Remember, either you carry yourself, or we carry. And part of the responsibility lies with you to make sure that you set the right example for everybody else. Does anyone remember this scene? <clears throat> 2009, January, and they land on a, it's an unscheduled landing on the Hudson River. Right, so break the airplane into two, now it landed safely, 155 people walked off, not hurt. Break the two into the back of the plane and the front of the plane. So let's say you're a passenger sitting on this plane and you are now in the air and all engines have shut off and you are making your way to land on the Hudson River. What do you feel? Well, let me tell you another airplane example. This is a true case, US. A plane is flying in the air and all of a sudden it goes suddenly down to the right, uh, to the right and down. Pilot recovers, brings it back and he turns on the loudspeaker and he says, you know, I apologize, ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you what happened. The flight attendant steward has brought me a cup of hot coffee and poured it in my lap. You should see what my pants look like in the front. Somebody in the back of the plane says, you should see what my pants look like in the back. <laughs> so, I'm assuming that this is a coffee stain in the back kind of moment if you're sitting in the coach section, right? So the plane is now making its descent and I don't know that much about flying, but I do know that you have one chance to do this right. So if you come in at the wrong angle, you have no engine, so you can't go around and say, well, let me try it again. If you hit it at the wrong angle, it rips the engine, the plane, the wing, the whole nine yard. All right? So you have one chance. Now, that's the back of the plane terrified, right? Religious moment for probably the 155 people. In the cockpit is the one man out of seven billion who is most prepared to land a commercial airplane with no engines. So he has been studying this and practicing this and studying it and practicing and studying and practicing. So what do you think he feels when the engine shut off? Yes! <laughs> this is my chance! <laughs> right, if, you are, if you're a fan of hockey, Wayne Gretzky, if you watch this, this NHL or the Stanley Cup, which is the coveted thing that they take away with them, Last game, seventh game, tied at the end of the three periods, and now you go into overtime, and they ask Wayne Gretzky, the next goal wins the whole season. How do you feel about it? And his answer is, this is the moment I've been waiting for all season. So their reaction is different than ours because we're not prepared and they are prepared. And the fact is, yesterday I spoke to a bunch of GE scholars and I said, you know, the biggest piece of advice I can give you is live your life intentionally. Forget drift. Know what you want to do and do it. And when you start to prepare and you start to get the processes going, now you have a good chance of being able to take on anything that comes at you. So that reaction is pretty positive for them. Now imagine this for a moment. So you're on that plane, it lands on the Hudson. You change your clothes because you're probably wet and you get on the next plane two hours later because you got to get home. That takes courage, right? But there's a math reason for that because the chances are of you being involved in an airplane crash mathematically, very small. If you just survived an airplane crash, I think you can take it off, right? Happened once in my life, that's it. I had my one crash. Does this guy in space ring a bell for anyone? He is one of the premier self-help gurus in the U.S. His name is Tony Robbins. He holds some incredible seminars. And one of the things that he says is that you need to become a friend of frustration. So we go through life with these great plans thinking that everything's going to be great. And then the first moment we run into a small problem, we, the wheels fall off the wagon and we have a panic attack. I was in a seminar in Dallas, 90 of us with the guy who's got his own TV show today, and a lady, and I know this obviously is not a sexist, I'm not picking on the ladies, but she gets up, and this guy's taller than I am, his name is Dr. Phil, he's taller than I am, 
And she looks at him and says, you know, this raising kids is so hard. And there's complete silence. And he walks up to her, taller than I. He looks at her and says, who the hell told you raising kids was easy? Because sometimes we're so surprised when things are difficult and it's a little uphill battle. That's what it's all about. If it were easy to be an entrepreneur, if it were easy to come up with great ideas, everybody would do it and there wouldn't be any value associated with it. So we need to become friends with, with frustration. And the way you do that is you expose yourself to things and where you don't have the fear, where you have the fear, you face it head on and you start to fill your bucket. This lady would have never been able to achieve what she achieved had she not become best friends with frustration. I mean, there is nothing positive about the surroundings or the circumstances under which she did what she did. And she's more well known than a lot of people who had money, equipment, computers at their service, but were never willing to step across that line and put themselves into the difficult questions. So, I, you know, you write it down, 2014, let's look at it five years from now. If you don't become a friend with frustration, um, it's not going to be easy. So, Let's talk about what I can actually do. So we know things are going to speed up. We know we have fears. And so now we need to put ourselves into a situation where we can actually effectively conquer those fears. The first one is a picture of a little kid reading. But it's more than reading. Obviously, I think you have to read. I think you have to read a lot. Um, there's a guy I know, he's a, he writes a lot. He reads a book a day. OK, you can argue he must have three hours to read. And he does. He makes three hours to read. But he reads a book a day. He's a phenomenal speaker. He is the general manager for the Orlando Magic NBA team. Great business guy. His name is Pat Williams. And he would talk about, I thought it was so wonderful, because he said two things we told every employee of the Orlando Magic. Two questions you have to answer yourself. If what you're doing does it either help the Magic win, or does it help the Magic sell more tickets? If what you're doing doesn't support those two, stop it and find something to do that helps the magic either win or support the tickets. Uh, now, kids, people around us normally don't read that much. So if we go back to the jail, we see the guy, one guy who reads Tutti Frutti Mugas. Not what you would call really a great source of inspiration. Certainly not for things that we would consider valuable. But most people don't read. An average book in the U.S., not Harry Potter, an average book in the U.S. sells how many copies? Eleven thousand. An average book in Hungary, not Harry Potter, sells how many copies? Three. Three thousand copies. Unless you are, unless you stay up on what's going on, and I don't. You can read these romance novels, okay, I'm, you know, I, I, it's not my first choice, but you need to make sure you understand what's going on around you. A little history, a little technology, a little medical, a little energy, because these are going to affect your lives. And part of my, my speech or my t a story to the church is, if you don't understand the question, you won't even be able to answer it. And so this holds true for you, for them, for all of us. If we don't understand the question, we won't even be asked for an answer. And you want to feel marginalized in life? Be on the outside of the field, and I'm not interested. I'm not interested in your opinion. And it's happening to a lot of people, because you look at these guys, for example, in jail. They spent 15 years in jail. They are so far behind that I can fully appreciate why many of them will come out and go right back in. Because they don't have the skills, they don't have the knowledge, they don't have the experience. And you either make it part of your life as a kid. You know, how many of you brushed your teeth last night? I would hope everybody's hand goes up. <laughs> and you should thank your mother and father for that. Because, I mean, I know my kids. There must be a genetic mutation. But had we not stood over them at age two, they wouldn't have brushed their teeth. It wasn't natural. There's nothing natural about that. And yet it becomes part of their life. And now they just do it automatically. Now, mine are thankfully small, so they don't drink alcohol yet. But there are a lot of people who actually go out and drink and still brush their teeth before they go to bed. The power of habit is unbelievable. Network. I don't care how you do it. I'll give you a tip on what I think you could do. 
but you need to meet as many possible people as you can. There's a great book called The Luck Factor, written by a British psychologist, and it talks about how you can actually create your own luck. I won't tell you the four things he talks about, but one of the four is creating a network that is so powerful that you can take it with you. Because right now, you're obviously used to working in small teams, but there'll come a day when you'll need the ex expertise and the assistance from somebody who's in a circle either higher or further away from you. And unless you have that network ahead of time, if you absolutely got a must have the right contact when you have a problem and you don't have that yet, guess what? Too late. Right? And then the bottom one, I think because we're all adults and we all understand what's going on, it's our responsibility to make sure that we help everyone around us be as curious as possible. Because if this gets killed in the child when they're young, it is so very difficult to restart in an adult. So if you don't have the right habits taking you forward, you're not associated with people who are thinking, exciting, inspired, you're not reading, you don't have the right group, it is really difficult to be alone in a cell in a jail and get curious on your own. So we owe that to each other. Now, I'm not telling you to go into jail to do it for those guys, but for all the people that you interact with, make sure that you set an inspiring example for them because ultimately they may get that spark from you today even though you may not think you're giving them that spark. That's the way it works. I can think back to some of the people in my life. And once you start to do that, once you make this part of your life, you start getting married. <coughs> right? So curious people, there may be a healthy level of anxiety, but they are interested in finding out what's the solution, what can I do. If I don't know it and I can't figure out, who can? And that's the best thing we got going forward. That's our secret weapon. We can create a bunch of curious people. And it's not enough to demand somebody else be curious. I gotta be curious. And I think it's easy to do. Once you start getting involved, I mean, it's unbelievable. This is, I'm gonna seem like bragging, but I'll tell you what we just did this weekend. Put together a program called DQ, Dying, Design, and Develop. Uh, very good, uh, I have a very good business relationship with the Corinthia Hotel, which is a five-star hotel in the US. And for the Sunday brunch, we put this program next to the Sunday brunch. So parents can go and enjoy a two, two and a half, three hour brunch and have their 10 to 15 year old kids in the hotel working with high tech. So this last Sunday, we introduced them to a three doodler pen, that one that writes in the air three dimensionally. And they get a chance to, we don't talk about it, we put it in their hands and they experience it. It's coming up Sunday, I'm convinced we'll have even more people because we will actually be flying drones inside the hotel. Quadcopters. If you know, if you've ever been in that hotel, you know on one side they have an atrium that's about 15 meters tall. And kids will be able to, kids 10 to 15, will be flying quadcopters. The quadcopter will have a, uh, a video camera and it will be live streaming what the quadcopter sees down to their smartphone so they can take it home and look at it and relive the experience. And all we're trying to do is expose kids so it's a win-win. The parents can eat with peace and quiet. My kids do not want to spend two hours in a restaurant. I'm lucky if I can get them to spend 20 hours in a restaurant, 20 minutes in a restaurant. But now it's a win-win because the parents can eat and they don't have a guilt feeling that they've outsourced their kids and made them do something stupid. And these kids, at four o'clock, we had to ask them this last Sunday, we had to tell them, it's over. You were here from noon to four, it's over. If you're really interested, uh, then we'll come back next week or if you want, if you're a parent, you can buy a few to and it's just our way of creating something for the kids. And when you talk about building your network, if you put some things out there that become associated with your name, it makes it a whole lot easier to go indoors because people realize that you may not be coming to ask for money in business, but you're actually doing something. And so I believe in taking these things and turning it into lifestyle. And then what I really believe is that, and you guys are at the beginning of your careers, so none of this is of value from a societal standpoint if you're doing no well. Something that disappoints me so very much in this country is there's the people who have made unbelievable amounts of money and they've built these unbelievable homes and then they've built even more unbelievably high fences around them and instead of sharing and giving back and encouraging, it's like they're drawing away. And our future, you guys are young, but my future is in your hands and my kids' futures, in your, uh, your future is in my kids' hands. 
you know, we figure out how to hand this baton off and get them excited and get them curious and get them giving back to society, the model will break. This does not happen accidentally. Remember I started off by saying about drift. You don't drift accidentally into a great society or into a great country or into a great entrepreneurial startup culture. You have to do it deliberately, and I think that decision, in fact, I know it is, it's in your hands. You can make the decision not to do it, and then 20 years or 10 years from now, uh, then we can sit down and discuss why that happened. But I think we can also make the decision that, damn it, I will do what I can to make sure that the kids behind me and the kids behind those who are behind me will get chances that I never got, that don't look at it from, oh, it's unfair, that's just the way life works. And it's our responsibility to light their candles so they can keep on lighting the candles behind us. I am convinced if we do this, it becomes part of our life, it will make a lasting and permanent impact on this society. And it will start to ripple out like it does so many times when you throw a rock into a river. But the choice is in your hands. And I have to commend this system. I have to commend the, the Schumann the, uh, BDC. I mean, what's happening here, you've got dedicated people like Kia and Joab. I am convinced that God danced the day they were born because he knew that it takes people who have the passion in their veins to keep sharing and giving it away. It's one of those crazy things, the more you give it away, ultimately, it will find the people who will take it, and as they say in football, will take the ball and run with it. And I'm, I'm convinced with the amount of people I've met down here that there are a lot of people who have that ability and have that desire to grab the ball and run across the goal line and create points and score goals for this country. It first starts here, first in Page, then in Hungary, and then in the region. I wish you guys unbelievable success in that adventure. I'm more than willing to help anywhere I can, or anywhere I can value this process. But you guys are in the right place at the right time. That's a great feeling. Thank you.